Our attention this afternoon is for an aspect of Scripture's teaching on the providence of God. And with respect to that, um, we'd like to read at this point Belgian Confession, Article 13, where the church summarizes and thus confesses what Scripture teaches on this point. Article 13, that's page 503 in your book of praise. There we confess, we believe that this good God, that is the good God who is triune, after he had created all things, did not abandon them or give them up to fortune or chance, but that according to his holy will, he so rules and governs them that in this world, Nothing happens without his direction. Yet God is not the author of the sins which are committed, nor can he be charged with them. For his power and goodness are so great and beyond understanding that he ordains and executes his work in the most excellent and just manner, even when devils and wicked men act unjustly. And as to his actions surpassing human understanding, we will not curiously inquire farther than our capacity allows us. But with the greatest humility and reverence, we adore the just judgments of God, which are hidden from us. And we content ourselves that we are pupils of Christ, who have only to learn those things which he teaches us in his word without transgressing these limits. This doctrine gives us inexpressible consolation, for we learn thereby that nothing can happen to us by chance, but only by the direction of our gracious heavenly Father. He watches over us with fatherly care, keeping all creatures so under his power that not one hair of our head, for they are all numbered, nor one sparrow can fall to the ground without the will of our Father. In this we trust, because we know that he holds in check the devil and all our enemies, so that they cannot hurt us without his permission and will. We therefore reject the damnable error of the Epicureans who say that God does not concern himself with anything but leaves all things to chance. As far our confession. In response to the sermon, we'll be singing from hymn 74, the stanzas 1 and 4. Dear children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, and guests, would you call God good? Article 13 does. God is good, for there's no evil in God. God can't stand evil. And yet, bad things happen in our world. Adversity and sin are part of everyday life. Storms, fires, earthquakes, droughts, stillborn children, heart disease, cancer, dementia, disabilities, a pandemic. Adversity abounds. And sometimes the evil is not just natural take COVID-19. Humans play a role in its spread. The spread of COVID-19 is very much unwilled, but as humans, we play a role in it. And sometimes evil is willed. In April of 2020, there was a mass murder in Nova Scotia. It was recently in the news again because of the inquiry associated with it. The largest mass murder 
known to Canada. There was a man who wanted to kill and took the lives of more than 20 people. He was only stopped when he was killed himself. And as you're probably aware, something similar happened in Buffalo not that long ago. But where is God in all of this? Tornadoes. Why does God create supercells? COVID. Why does God afflict humanity in, in that most impactful way? And in Nova Scotia or any other mass murder. There's so much that God could have done. Where is God in all of this? And we confess that the good God, according to his holy will, so rules and governs all things that in this world nothing happens without his direction. So the answer to that question, where is God in all of this, is everywhere. Everywhere. And you know, no one less than the Lord Jesus Christ taught that without a father's will, no sparrow falls to the ground, no hair falls from our head. Well, it doesn't get more mundane than that. God directs the winds that blow and create tornadoes. God directs where every single virus cell goes. And God directs the flight paths of bullets. Beloved, this afternoon we're going to pay attention to that very thorny and sensitive matter of God and evil. As we do so, we are what one man has called pondering the imponderable, or another man seeking to explain the inexplicable. And I'm saying it now before we begin. We're not going to get very far. We will definitely see how Scripture speaks. As we heard this morning, that's the touchstone. That's what you go by. We'll listen to how God himself describes his own interaction with evil. We're going to learn the limits of our understanding. But we're not going to doubt God's goodness. Our faith will be strengthened. And so we listen to God's instruction. I sum it up with this theme. Our almighty Father is in control of all things, also evil. And we'll consider first what evil is, and then where evil comes from, and finally, evil and God. First of all, what it is. The word evil immediately conjures up in our minds the image of intentional and moral badness. Maybe you've kind of thought, well, this is weird. How can you describe a tornado as evil? But the thing is that Scripture only has one word here. In an English Bible translation, it's sometimes translated with evil. But in other places, the translation will say harm, calamity, disaster, trouble. I think the term badness, badness might catch the breadth of the term in Scripture's original languages. For it's both true for Hebrew and Greek, Old and New Testament. But badness is not a word we commonly use. That said, even though Hebrew and Greek do just use a single word, it is helpful to make a bit of a distinction. We want to distinguish, at least at the beginning, between the evil of disaster and the evil of disobedience. You could also say the evil of suffering and the evil of sin. Take a tornado, that's the evil of disaster, the evil of suffering. The damage caused by a tornado, that's just plain bad. Now the words used in the Bible for evil, disaster, and trouble are the opposite to the words that are used for good. Good, especially in the Hebrew language, has the flavor of it's suited for purpose. When God had created all things, we read in Scripture, God looked at everything and saw that everything was very good. And that means everything was exactly as God had intended it. God had assigned it a task, and it could do that. And so if something was not good, if something was evil or bad, you might say it was malfunctioning. It was not doing what it's supposed to be doing. 
And that's what we see happen with, with what we tend to call natural disasters. Such events cause chaos while God created order. That's also why such disasters will not exist in the future world, in the new creation. Disasters like tornadoes are part of what the Apostle Paul referred to when he speaks of the groaning of all creation. Take the deaths of a mass murder, like in Nova Scotia. There we're talking the evil of disobedience, the evil of sin. And the evil of sin is more complex than the evil of disaster. Sin is disobedience to God's command of love and loyalty. You see, God had created human beings to be his image, to be in the likeness of God. And, and one aspect to that is true righteousness and holiness. And so God's will for our lives is expressed as you shall love God above everyone else and you shall love others as you love yourselves. So those who keep the law of love are the ones who are righteous and holy. Those who don't sin. And so by definition, sin is actually an act of selfishness. Sin that's not caring about others. Sin that, that's being willing to even hurt others. Sin proceeds from self-centeredness. Sin that's turning your back on God. It's missing the purpose of your life. It's rebelling against God. It's being out of line with God's guidelines for life. And the evil of sin differs from the evil of suffering in that the evil of sin involves a being, a creature, a person with his own will and a freedom to act contrary to God's will. A tornado does not, cannot disobey God. A storm has no conscience. A storm has no will. But human beings do. That's how God made us. And by the way, not only us, the angels as well. And so the evil of disaster, that's where cre creation simply doesn't function as it was intended to. But the evil of disobedience, that's where intelligent creatures, for whatever reason, do not function as God intended them. For angels, for example, sin means leaving their original position of service. And for humans, sin means acting in a self-seeking way. So tornadoes, that's the evil of suffering. A mass murder like in Nova Scotia or Buffalo, that's the evil of sin. COVID is a bit more complex because there's a bit of both. It's the combination of a, of a creature, a virus, and of human activity. The virus causes ill health, lead for some to complications that may even result in death. The virus spreads via human activity, and so it involves decisions by humans as to what to do and what not to do, which means that COVID actually has elements of both evil of suffering and evil of sin. And there's a further aspect in this. Scripture in Numbers 15 distinguishes between intentional sin and unintentional or voluntary sin. What that means is we can sin without realizing it because we didn't know that something was a sin or because we didn't realize that our actions, what, what our actions could cause. But we can also sin knowingly on purpose. Um, again, with COVID, for example, when you test positive, you're supposed to take measures to prevent it from spreading from you to others. But then again, someone may, may also have the virus, but not displaying the symptoms. And when such a person ventures out and is found to have infected someone else, there's what you could call an unintentional sin, an unintentional evil. And, and then there's the person who doesn't yet have a positive diagnosis, but is displaying the symptoms. So you're wondering, well, are you having COVID, or do you have a cold, or have you just got allergies? My point with all of this is, there's a whole spectrum here. There's a whole range. It's not just, oh, it's this, or this, or this, or this. And it's even more complex yet, because what one person regards as scientifically proven, another person says is misinformation. One thing we do see 
is that where there is the evil of sin, there will be the evil of suffering. Think now of King David being cursed by Shimei. Shimei was sinning. David was suffering on account of the sinning of Shimei. Which means maybe we shouldn't be speaking of the evil of suffering and the evil of sin, but we should speak of the evil caused by disaster and the evil that's caused by disobedience. Disaster, that's about the curse under which creation groans. Creation doesn't function as God originally created it to. And disobedience is about the sins committed by creatures with a will. Creatures deliberately not fulfilling their role as God had originally created them to. And so evil, malfunction, badness... At bottom, this is about things being the way God had not made them to be. A storm is evil. Sin is evil. It actually does make sense that Scripture uses only a single term here. Because evil is things not being as they should be. Evil is when things malfunction. And that said, it brings us to two questions. First, where did evil come from? And then secondly, what is now the connection, the relationship between evil and God in our world today? First, and this is the second point of the sermon, the origin of evil. Let's, let's go back to disasters again. Why do tornadoes happen? Why do people get cancer? Why does death and destruction surround us? Well, it's all because creation has been placed under a curse. Genesis 3 recounts how God cursed the ground so that humans would have to toil, fighting thorns and thistles, eating food in the sweat of his brow, until he would die and become dust again. And any new human life would come through labor and pain. One could go on. Creation was subjected to decay, to futility, we read in Romans 8. Life in and of itself without God is a mist. It's a vapor. You can't get it, we read in Ecclesiastes. And it's in Genesis 3 that we read how things change. God shut the way to paradise, no trespassing. Man and woman left wearing clothes made of animal skins. Death occurred so that man and woman might not be filled with self-centered feelings of lust for each other. The snake, he, he slithered away on his belly, licking the dust as it went, without legs and shamed. Creation no longer functioned as it originally had. Genesis 3, that's where creation malfunctions. You could say creation had gone bad. But though creation malfunctioned, this did not mean that God had lost control. No. Take this for example. God would employ enmity. Enmity is an evil. But God would employ enmity to punish humanity. And at the same time to save humanity. And so when you look at a storm, a storm doesn't just wreak havoc. According to Psalm 97, there are also indicators of God's might. For example, Jesus' divinity is proven, among others, by his control over wind and water. Avalanches, tornadoes, earth tremors, lightning strikes, as the insurance industry would like, to, like it said, they are acts of God. So evil in the sense of disasters finds its origin in the curse imposed by God on our world. And the reason for God placing this world under a curse points us to the origin of the evil of sin. Now for the sake of time I'm going to be brief here because boys and girls, even you, know the story. In paradise, Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command. Lord's Day 4 notes that this disobedience was deliberate. 
deliberate disobedience. If, like me, you've learned an older version of the catechism, maybe you remember willful disobedience. It tells you man chose to sin. The entrance of sin into this world was the responsibility of us human beings. The origin of the evil of disobedience in our human world had its origins with us humans. We should never forget that. We allowed evil. We brought evil actively into our world. It's very interesting that the Belgian Confession always talks about the plunge into sin. Not the fall into sin, but the plunge into sin. Now some will say, but hang on a minute, I know my catechism. It doesn't say in the catechism at the instigation of the devil. Yeah, that's true. The devil was sinning as well. But the fact that the devil was urging us humans to sin doesn't now all of a sudden absolve us of responsibility. It actually makes it worse. Because humans were created in the likeness of God. That was an honor not even accorded to angels. The devil as an angel was of a lower rank than humans which tells you that in sinning, humans stooped to listen and obey to a lesser creature. What is clear is that evil, in the sense of sin, of disobedience to God, already existed before Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command to eat of the forbidden tree. So we ask, well, where did that evil come from? How is it that some of the angels became sinful? We don't exactly know. We do know that all creatures, all angels were created by God. Colossians 1. We also know that some of these angels fell from their original position. That's Jude, verse 6. But we don't know when exactly angels were created, like what day of creation. We don't know when some of these angels fell. We don't even know what exactly their sin was. Though given the activity of devils, it has something to do with pride. Satan and the evil spirits are constantly trying to control humans instead of serve humans. Devils are malfunctioning angels. But God hasn't given us the details. And as Belgian Confession Article 13 says, we ought to keep our curiosity in check. So when it comes to evil as such, we don't know exactly how it came to be. We do know originally it didn't exist. Everything was very good. We know it somehow made entrance into the world of the spirits. And we're very clear on the fact that we humans ourselves willfully allowed evil into our world. As such, it's worthwhile to keep in mind when you ponder the reality of evil, of sin, that it's not God, but it's us humans who gave evil access to this world. And that then brings us to our last thought, evil and God. Evil is things not being the way God originally intended them to be. Humans willfully allowed evil into the world. But now we'll say, hang on a minute, God can prevent evil. He is almighty. He is good. And instead we find that evil continues. In fact, we find that God even uses evil like enmity. What are we to make of that? Well, to come to grips with this, we need to consider what Scripture teaches on how God takes care of creation, even the hairs on our head. We call that the doctrine of providence. God provides. And generally, providence is seen from three perspectives. The perspective of preservation, the perspective of cooperation, and the perspective of governing preservation, that's about how God keeps everything the same and keeps things going. For example, God ensures that the seasons come and go. 
that, that stars and planets and all other space things hold to their orbits, that, that birds migrate at their allotted times, that the plants grow, that animals are born, that, that people have food to eat, all those kinds of things. By way of illustration, think of an airplane, and now think of what a mechanic is to an airplane. A mechanic maintains a plane, so God maintains creation. Cooperation, that's the second perspective, is about how God interacts with creatures in events. In an event, God will play a role and a creature may play a role. For example, God may give a lion energy and that lion sees a zebra and, and the lion jumps the zebra to, to, to catch it and eat it. In that case, the illustration is more like what a pilot is to an airplane. The pilot causes the plane to move and so God causes things to happen in creation. And then government, uh, that's about how God directs events so that his purposes are accomplished. His decree takes place. For example, if God has decided that the zebra should die, then the lion jumping the zebra will actually kill the zebra. Or think of what we confess with Lord's Day 1. All things must work together for my salvation. All things must work together for my salvation. In this case, it's like the control tower and the airplane. The control tower has the plane fly in a certain place, or if it's on the ground, berth at a certain gate. Preservation, cooperation, government. If a creature is a plane, God is the mechanic preserving the plane. He is the pilot cooperating with the plane and the control tower directing the plane. And all three of those touch the matter of God and evil. From the perspective of preservation, for example, God is the one who has both the righteous and the wicked live. As Paul said to the Athenians, in God we all live and move and have our being. That's also true for unbelievers. From the perspective of government, we confess that God is even able to turn evil to our good. The classic illustration from Scripture for that is Joseph's brothers. Joseph tells his brothers, look, you meant it for harm, but God turned it to good. But as to the perspective of cooperation, it gets a little more complicated here. To understand cooperation well, we need to acquaint ourselves with another concept, that of primary and secondary cause. Because it's often argued that God is the primary cause of all things and that creatures are the secondary cause of things. For example, picture the carcass of an animal rotting in the sun that stinks. In that illustration, the sun is the primary cause of the stench and the carcass is the secondary cause. And in relation to evil, it will then be said that God is the primary cause and man is the secondary cause. God gives man the energy to sin and God gives man a will to choose what to do and a man chooses to use the energy that God has given him to sin. What's nice about this is that in this approach, God is in no way responsible for man's sin. Think again of the carcass. We'll say the carcass stinks. No one's going to say the sun stinks. And that's why we'll say man sins and not God sins. But, and for sake of the Korean brothers, this is what I learned from Dr. Hoches. If you think deeply about this explanation, there's some flaws here. This works really well for anybody who believes that man has a free will. But as the Reformed will argue from Scripture that God does actually more than just give energy for man to act. God is at work in man to act. 
either inclining man's action to good or inclining it to evil. For example, Romans 9, that difficult passage, Scripture says God may soften a man's heart. God may harden a man's heart. And the account we read from 2 Samuel gives us a very good illustration here. Did you, for example, notice what David said about Shimei cursing him? Let me quote it again. 2 Samuel 16, verse 11. Leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. So David was convinced that the Lord had told Shimei to go and curse David. And yet, upon David's return, Shimei confesses to David that his act had been a sin. 2 Samuel 19, verse 19 and 20. Put the two together, you get this. So the Lord told Shimei to sin. And there are more examples of this in Scripture. I'll mention just one. It's the night that Jesus was betrayed. The Lord Jesus is eating with his disciples. He has just indicated that Judas Iscariot will betray him. The other disciples don't quite catch on what's going on. And then we read in John 13, verse 27, I quote, Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him, and Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Jesus told Judas to go and betray him. You know, it's quite common for Christians to consider sin something that God permits, something that God allows. God gives the energy unto sin. He, he frees the slack on the leash. Um, Satan can do all he wants, but God is still holding the leash and he can yank on it if need be. That understanding of providence of evil uh, and evil goes all the way back to the church father Augustine. And many men of the Great Reformation, and they also saw things in this way. And that's how also it's very popular among Protestants today. Also among Reformed and Presbyterian people. But there was one Reformer who had a different view. Early on in his life, he saw things the way Augustine described it. But over time, he came to realize, Scripture doesn't just speak of God's indirect involvement in evil but of God's direct involvement to the point of actively steering it and making it happen. Think of Shimei being told by the Lord to curse David. Think of Romans 9, which says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And the name of the reformer who saw things differently, you might be guessing it, that was John Calvin. And it's Calvin's understanding that our Reformed confessions tend to follow. Our own confessions, the perspective of cooperation goes unmentioned. We do find the words allow and permit, but there's nothing in our confessions about primary and secondary causes. It would seem that Guido de Bre, observing how various Reformers thought differently on the issue, he figured, well, I better not say too much on this score. Let's be careful. And that's why you get a line like, we will not curiously inquire farther than our capacity allows us. And by the way, beloved, that's the wisdom of being reformed. Don't get yourself stuck in scholastic formulations and distinctions when opinions about something diverge. And in regard to providence, that's very much Calvin who argued that other reformers were being far too philosophical about the whole matter. Which is interesting because Calvin was trained as a humanist lawyer. And now he has written a marvelous piece on providence in his institutes. What he does is he simply quotes Bible text after Bible text to make his point. He says, where evil is concerned, God's providence is more than God permitting, allowing things to happen. No, it is about God willing it to happen. 
And that position is reflected in the Belgian Confession at the end of Article 13. They cannot hurt us without his permission and will. Those words, and will, are very important. And then Guido de Brer said, and I'm going to stop here. But Calvin went a step further yet. He said, God commands evil to happen. God commands evil to happen. And Shimei cursing David is one of the examples from Scripture that Calvin points to. And when you read through the fairly long list of all the Scripture quotes that Calvin has, you cannot be but impressed that Calvin's got a point. God permits evil? Yes. God wills evil? Yes. God commands evil? Yes. The most evil deed ever committed by humanity, the betrayal of God's Christ that would lead to his murder, was commanded by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But, doesn't that make God the author of sin? Now, Calvin indeed came very close to saying so, which is why Guido de Bres says what he does. To quote Calvin, this is from the Institutes, two quotes. I have already shown plainly enough that God is called the author of all the things that these fault finders would have happen only by his indolent permission. God declares that he creates light and darkness, that he forms good and bad, that nothing evil happens that he himself has not done. That's the first quote. But Calvin, and this is the second point, Calvin did not consider that this excused people from their sins. So is God the author of sin? Well, two remarks. First of all, what do we mean when we say author? In Belgian Confession Article 13 we read, Yet God is not the author of the sins which are committed, nor can he be charged with them. The point is, God cannot be held accountable for the sins that occur by his permission, by his will. And I, like Calvin, would add at his command. God didn't curse David. Shimei did. God didn't betray Jesus. Judas did. Just like the sun doesn't stink, but the carcass does. The point is, we can't say, as the ancient Gentiles would, God made me sin. What could I do about it? No. God created man with a will that could resist sin. We confess that with the canons of Dory. And therefore, man himself carries the full responsibility for his sins. It's his fault, man's fault, that man malfunctions. Is God the author of sin? First of all, no. Not in the sense that God carries the blame for sin. And second, consider that what makes sin an act sinful isn't just the act itself, but the intention of the act. Think again of Joseph, who said to his brothers, and now I'll quote scripture, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Or take Shimei. David figures God might actually have a righteous purpose in having Shimei curse him. Or think of that well-known text on God's providence in Romans 8, after speaking about suffering in this world, the groaning of creation, our own personal struggles, our imperfect prayers to God, the Spirit had Paul write, and we know that in all things, God works for good, for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, also evil, God works for the good. See, God doesn't sin. Everything he does is a display of his righteousness and mercy. The angelic world may have malfunctioned, so now we've got devils. Humans have malfunctioned. And so we have sinners, and, and there's evil in this world. But beloved, God is unchangeable. God is good. God does not malfunction. 
Yes, God does not malfunction. God never malfunctions. He is so powerful that he can use evil for good. Now, we often don't see the, evil, the good in evil, but God does. God can avert evil. And who knows how much evil is being restrained by God each day. God can also use evil, turn adversity to our benefit. And knowing that God purposes good, even with evil, that means that we can always be at peace. We're not called to understand. We're called to believe, to have faith. Think of Job, the man who suffered but never knew why. He persevered in faith. And think of Golgotha. Yes, think of Golgotha. Humans ask, why isn't God doing anything about evil? He is. He is. He, he sent the Christ. He sent his son to, to become one of us, to, to conquer and to, to banish evil from this world forever. We, we're on our way to a new creation. And, and in that new creation, there's not going to be any evil. It's just that we're not there yet. And we have, to abide, we have to abide God's time. And so we pray, Lord, help us endure. Our Almighty Father is in control of all things, also evil. As I said at the beginning, we've been pondering the imponderable. We've learned that Scripture teaches us that God does more than just allow evil to happen. He wills it. One can even say, think of Shimei, think of Judas Iscariot, God commands it. Have I explained it? No. How evil came to be in God's good world and how God interacts with evil today, that, that's a mystery of the faith. The mystery of the faith is like the Trinity or, or the two natures of Jesus Christ. The Belgian Confession is spot on when it says, let us content ourselves, so be at peace with ourselves, that we are pupils of Christ who have only to learn those things which he teaches us in his word without transgressing those limits. And so, beloved, we have faith in a God who allows evil, who wills evil, and who can even be said to command evil. Is that smart? Yes, because God is not an evil God. He is the God of love. He is almighty. Your God is your Father. And so take to heart what the Belgian Confession goes on to say. I love that line. This doctrine gives us inexpressible consolation, comfort. For we learn thereby that nothing, not even evil, can happen to us by chance, but only by the direction of our gracious Heavenly Father. Or in the words of our catechism, what does it benefit us to know that God has created all things and still upholds them by His providence? We can be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity. And with a view to the future, we can have a firm confidence in our faithful God and Father that no creature shall separate us from His love. For all creatures are so completely in His hand that, and here it comes, without his will, they cannot so much as move. Amen.